Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2014 Royalty Air Museum Speaker Series. Today, a special day on Friday, the Royalty Air Museum and its Cooperating Society are proud to present Dr. Michael Newbury. Mike is an instructor at Columbus State University in Columbus, Georgia. Mike is originally from Moorhead, Minnesota. He received his, PhD, uh, his bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point, and he decided to stay at the University of Wisconsin to pursue his master's degrees in fisheries, where he studied submerged trees as fish habitats in northern Wisconsin. Subsequently, Mike moved to uh, North Dakota State University in Fargo to pursue his PhD. For his dissertation, he studied the relationship between temperature and growth character characteristics in various fishes to test the hypothesis that climate change may be a mechanism for speciation in some types of fish. Upon completing his PhD, Mike moved to Alberta to hold a joint postdoctoral fellowship between the Royal Taylor Museum and the University of Alberta for two and a half years, and then continued as a full-time postdoctoral fellow at the museum for the following three and a half years. Mike left the museum late last year to take on a position at Columbus State University. Mike's research interests focus on the evolution and biology of Mesozoic fishes and sharks. In addition to publishing 18 scientific papers in the six years he spent at the museum, Mike has played a leading role in involving graduate and undergraduate students, as well as Encana Science Camp kids in various aspects of scientific research, from fossil collection all the way to data analysis. Finally, but not least, Mike has been the leading force behind the excavation of the Pisces Point locality situated north of Drumheller, an important fish, uh, fossil fish locality that may force us to rewrite textbooks. Today, Mike will present an overview of various research projects he has conducted on Cretaceous freshwater rays and sharks from ancient Alberta. So without further delay, I present you Dr. Michael Newbury. Thank you, Francois. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes? Okay, I'm getting a thumbs up in the back. That's great. So, yeah, my talk today is entitled, Who are the Freshwater Sharks and Rays of the Cretaceous Scholar Formation of Alberta? So I'll give you a bit of an overview. There's not a very long list. However, I do have a lot to say. And as you've noticed, there are quite a few people uh, listed uh, as authors here. Uh, and probably a surprise to some in the room. Sorry for not telling you guys, like Allison and Darren. But this is not a whole list. So I actually have other title slides inserted in the middle of the talk, which will kind of weird you out. But nevertheless, you'll be able to see that there are other authors as well involved in the various projects that I am summarizing today. So fishes. There's an estimated 32,000 species of fishes, the largest group are the cyprinids, and there are over 220 genera of cyprinids. Uh, sharks and rays are included in this group, for example, and that's what I'll be focusing on today. These are called elasmobranchs. And the term elasmos is Greek. It means thin, flexible, beaten metal. And the second part of the word elasmobranch, sorry, is uh, branchios, meaning gill. So these are known as the plate gill fishes. Uh, one group of the elasmobranchs are the sharks. There's nine orders, 17 families, 72 genera, and 403 species. They represent 1.3% of all fishes living today. One of the groups I'll be talking about today are the erectiloviforms. They're the carpet sharks, and there's 32 species living today. This is an example of the whale shark, Rhynchodon typhus. Uh, they get up to 12 meters long and 20 uh, tons. The other group I'll be talking about today are the rays. There are four orders, 34 families, 106 genera, and 534 species. 1.7% of all living fishes today. This is a shovel-nosed guitar fish. And I am interested in the Pisces Point locality. Francois mentioned that already. Uh, this is a locality in Dry Island Buffalo Jump Provincial Park. There's Andy Newman as a scale bar. This represents uh, a river deposit and uh, the way we perceive it, uh, an abandoned river channel. So we have an active channel down here. This is at the base of the scholar formation. And the channel probably gets uh, uh, bypassed by the uh, main channel. And it turns into a stagnant water wetland. That's these brown deposits that you see here, these organic deposits. And then it turns back on as a river channel. So it floods, and then it turns off, and 
and get a stagnant water deposit, does this repeatedly until it becomes a very common occurrence that it's uh, stagnant water, which is thin little bands of sandstone. But these, these layers, the sandstone layers and the organic layers, uh, produce fish and many other kinds of organisms and gives us a snapshot of what the environment uh, contained at that time. So a very important locality. Now, at the base of the locality, we have uh, shark's teeth and we have ray teeth occurring up through the deposit. So I'm very curious about these things. And I've been doing literature reviews. There's been some publishing going on with regard to these uh, organisms, and I will tell you about that. Now, the uh, Pisces Point locality on this very sexy image of satellite imagery. Thank you, Jen Bensescu, for providing such a wonderful image. Uh, there are actually a series of these Pisces Point-like deposits and what Dave Ebert refers to as a meander belt of these channel deposits, these rivers moving across the landscape through time, leaving behind deposits that are a lot like Pisces, uh, the Pisces Point locality itself. The same kinds of plants, same kinds of fishes in them. So, very unique environment. The Pisces Point locality occurs in the base of the Scholar Formation, just above the Nihil's Tuff, so to speak, and the Tuff is dated at 66.8 million years. You'll hear me talk about other formations in the talk, though. Uh, the Horseshoe Canyon Formation below it, and uh, even the Dinosaur Park and Old Man Formations, which are dated much older, around 76 million years, for example. I have an overall basic outline that I'll be following. First, I'll talk about Erectiloviforms, and then I'll talk about Mylodaphis in a very general sense. So the first part of my uh, talk will be on Erectiloviforms. It'll be a little longer. The Mylodaphis component will be much shorter. So there's one of the title slides that I inserted that will probably weird you all. But there's other names here as well that, that need to be drawn attention to. So uh, this was a talk that I gave, this first component of this talk, I gave at a meeting uh, in Vienna, Austria this last summer, the Mesozoic Fishes 6 meeting. And it's on uh, an erectiloviform skeleton from the Scholar Formation. Uh, the outline for this part of the talk, I'll be talking about a, a short introduction to erectiloviforms. I'll talk about this uh, skeleton that was described in 1918, uh, a Paleospinax and the locality, what we think the locality is where it came from. I'll talk about isolated shark and ray material from the scholar formation and introduce you to those taxa. I'll describe the material and then I'll classify it uh, as an erectiloviform. So erectiloviforms, uh, the order was erected by Applegate in 1972, so even fairly recently. These are carpet sharks, they're circumglobal in distribution in warm temperate and tropical seas today. They're all marine. Uh, they occur in the fossil record from the Jurassic, and there's greater than seven families. We don't have a good idea how many families there are, because we lack skeletal material, like what I'll be describing today. Uh, today there are seven families, 14 genera, 32 species according to Nelson. And you see a banded bamboo shark here as an example of this group. Now the fossil is really interesting. Um, this was described by Lawrence Lamb in 1918. It was described as Paleospinax adjunctitis uh, from the Edmonton Formation. Uh, it resides at the Canadian uh, Museum of Nature. And this is the image that uh, Lamb published. When I first looked at this, I was completely confused by it. What is that? Yeah, it looks sort of like a shark tail, maybe like an erectiloviform tail, but then there's these centra that look a lot like myelodaphis. Just bizarre. Um, so um, I became very curious about it. Uh, Becky Sanchez went home for Christmas. She had to stop at the Canadian Museum of Nature, looked at the specimen, brought some photographs back. Karen Tanky went out, uh, looked at the specimen, uh, looked for field notes on it, became, became curious about it. He was visiting the museum. So, uh, this was described as uh, Paleospinax adjunctitis, but Duffin and Ward in 93 considered Paleospinax a nomen dubium. So the name is no longer valid. Uh, this Jurassic group of fishes that, oddly enough, would be found uh, in Upper Cretaceous deposits in Alberta. Seems very odd to me. So Gardner in 66 considered uh, the Canadian Museum of Nature specimen hyodontid. Hyodontids don't even have calcified centra as Lamb figured here, is not a hyodontid. So, Lamb in 1980, 1918 reported that George Sturdberg collected the specimen, gave it a field number, this was in 1915. 
350 feet above the Red Deer River, three miles north of Tolman, Alberta. That's pretty damn close to us. So, uh, and he also reported that it was from the Edmonton Formation. Nice of him to provide that information because it helps to place it into context a bit more. Now, Sternberg, oh, thank you, Sternberg, in 47, uh, reported that uh, this taxon came from above the tough horizon. Darren provided this information. Thank you, Darren, of course, you're co-author, so I should have to thank you. But very cool, nonetheless, that he picked this out. So this places it up in the Scholar Formation. Oh my, then I'm becoming very curious about this specimen, because then it should relate to the taxa that are found in the Pisces Point locality. So uh, Darren found some of Charles Sternberg's uh, field notes at the Canadian Museum of Nature. He provided uh, some coordinates and uh, found a map that was recreated in the 1950s. So we can sort of place it on the map with some of what is probably transcribed uh, notes from an earlier map. Uh, Sternberg noted that it was on the east side of the river, near the top of the formation, and found with 10 to 12 leaves. Leaves are extremely rare in the scholar formation. So that's intriguing. 10 to 12 leaves? We get them at Pisces Point and those Pisces Point localities, but I haven't seen them anywhere else in the formation yet. Not that I've looked at all rock outcrops, but I've looked at a moderate amount and I haven't seen any other leaves. Other people have too. Okay, so we went out to those coordinates and Oh, yeah, by the way, this is another one of Jen Ben Seskew's beautiful satellite imagery uh, maps. So we went out to that area, um, and we found leaves. We called it the leaf litter locality. There are leaves all over the place. Really neat. Um, so we know we're close to the locality. We don't know exactly where it is. So I'll describe that in a bit more detail. So as we're standing on the locality, which is uh, Talus Slope, we see this. We see the Battle Formation. We see the New Hills Tuck. This is all scholar formation up here, so the base of the scholar is going up. And then there's these rocks coming down the hill, and they have leaves on them. And this is what it looks like. So there's uh, rocks coming down, uh, there's leaves on these rocks. This is a flatness type leaf or something related to it. Uh, this is uh, Ugo. You guys remember Ugo Martin Abad, uh, from a PhD student from the Universidad uh, Autonoma de Madrid. So um, he was out helping me look for these things. Allison was out that day as well. We found the leaves. So I showed them to Francois. I brought back a sample of the matrix from the original shark, and that's what it looks like here. Gray with an orange rind around the outside. It looks a lot like the leaves. And I talked to Francois. Francois did pin sections on these various things, and he tracked it to a layer up above us. And this is a river channel deposit here of uh, well-consolidated sandstone. And uh, the thin sections, when you look at them, they match up quite well. So um, we, we think we've got, somewhere in this horizon, our, our shark layer. So um, Francois provided this imagery here. Uh, so it's in the lower part of the scholar formation. Uh, the leaves occur about 28 meters above the base in this um, orange, orange sandstone, which is very comparable to that of the shark. So we think we're pretty close in that area based on Sternberg's notes and the occurrence of leaves. They don't seem to occur in other layers or in other spots around the area and we've looked. Now as you stand looking across the river, uh, Francois would say, well everything dips to the west. So we're looking downhill, here we have the Nevis Coal. This is the uh, Cretaceous Paleogene boundary where the dinosaurs went extinct. We've got a 55 meter package of scholar formation. So the scholar sandstone, we've got the knee hills tough, the battle formation down below is Fortune Canyon formation. So we don't see those river channel deposits on the other side of the river. Uh, they're just localized to uh, where we're standing. So what do we know about um, taxa and the teeth from the scholar formation of sharks and rays? Because when I look at this thing, I'm really quite confused. You know we have Mylodaphis. And this just came out uh, weeks ago. Uh, this is Mylodaphis pustulosus. This is a new species uh, in Cook, Newbury, Brinkman et al. And uh, Mylodaphis is characterized by tubercles on the occlusal surface of the teeth on the labial side, so the lip side of the tooth. We have a large transverse crest that crosses the tooth, and we have perpendicular enamelate folds on the lingual side of the tooth. Uh, so here we have occlusal, we have uh, labial, lingual, and basal views of these teeth. This is from Pisces Point right here. These are 
from the health group formation, for example. So we know we got myelodapus. They're there. We also know we have an erecta loba form. And uh, this, in the same publication, was described as Restesia. We erected a new genus. This was, was called Squatterina americana. Essie's named it. Um, this is labial, lateral, lingual, basal view. Uh, so the uh, lingual face is generally very smooth. Uh, the, the crown foot has labial emarginations on either side of a well-developed apron uh, formed from the, the um, descending heels. Uh, there are heels that are round, oblique, and continuous with a needle-like uh, uh, median cusp. In basal view, the, um, the root is heart-shaped, and there's a large nutritive uh, foramen and uh, groove that uh, the groove bisects the root. So we know we've got this erectolobin. Now, Capetta would caution us not to classify it as an erectolobin, but that is what we do. Uh, we, we, we stuck it in the family as other authors have done. So, so we've got two taxa. That, that leads me to the question, well, is this properly figured? This doesn't look exactly like a, what I would call a myelodapus tail. Not that I've ever seen one. Nobody's ever seen one. Uh, but these central look a lot like myelodapus. Uh, is it an erectile orbit? Don't know. But let's take a look at the data. So, um, there are these lines occurring on the centra. It's a lot like a lamniform. Lamniforms today, this is the white shark, have these radial lamellae that extend from the focus out to the side. But they also have foramina along the side. I don't see any foramina figured here. So my initial thought was, well, it's probably not a lamniform. Lamniforms are all marine. But so are erectiloviforms. Um, Myelodaphis, this is from Alicia Wilson's paper just published in CJDS. Uh, Myelodaphis have, have a solid intermedialia. They have these little lines across the surface uh, and spool-shaped centra. They're very similar. This could be Myelodaphis. The centra of uh, that line figure don't look anything like a rectiloviforms. Rectiloviforms have a large lateral foramen, so anterior, lateral, dorsal, ventral views, and they have uh, radial lamellae. This is the image that uh, Becky took when she visited the Canadian Museum of Nature. Yeah, that's hard to see, isn't it, guys? Somebody stuck white paint around the outside of the shark, and they got it mostly right, but not exactly. And uh, it's really hard to see. So I was looking at the pictures, and I couldn't really tell what I was looking at, because it's such a poorly preserved specimen. But it does have a lot of good characteristics. You have to look at it the right way. So once you coat it in ammonium chloride and remove the surrounding rock, you get something that looks like this. Okay, well that's starting to look a lot more interesting to me. Doesn't look a lot like, to me, uh, the figure that, that Lamb provided. So, redescription of the material is absolutely necessary. And I will do that here. So here we have the uh, caudal lobe. This is part of the uh, tail fin. It's crescentic in shape. Uh, it occurs at a moderate angle above the vertebral axis. It's not horizontal, as many erectile lobe forms are. And it's not real elongated as some of the lobe forms are. Uh, there's no evidence of, of a subterminal notch, which would occur right in here. There's little bits of, of cartilage and skin out here. Uh, between the upper uh, postventral and preventral regions, we have a very rounded margin. It has this upper uh, caudal lobe, but no uh, ventral caudal lobe. Okay, that's very erect, the lobe form like. But it has um, this, this very significant V-shaped notch in the anal caudal fin space. The anal fin is uh, low, it's uh, broad, generally rounded at the apex that extends ventrally, uh, and it has a pelvic clasper, well calcified. It's an adult male. The tail has epicordal cartilages here that are uh, quite broad. Interstitial spaces are less than half the, the uh, width of the cartilages. Uh, here, the light has been reversed, so it looks more three-dimensional. So it's from the lower right. Here are the vertebrae. And the vertebrae are interesting. There's a large sediment-filled lateral foramen, and there's radial uh, lamellae on the side of the vertebral centrum. Uh, the corpora calcara, the ends of the centrum, are uh, very thin. They are not very thick, as in myelodapus. Uh, so very, very different than what Lamb figured. Damn it, Lamb. 
So um, there's a pelvic clasper. We have sandstone covering part of the pelvic clasper. We have a clasper canal present and a cover rapidian and bits of uh, clasper hanging off the back of that. So uh, we've got a clasper that's uh, got characteristics of a rectal form. It's covered in denticles. Here you see them in basal view. Uh, they're a sinuous outline with a large nutritive foramen running up the middle. Uh, in apical view, they're lance-shaped, they're fluted, they're modified uh, for fast-moving water, interestingly enough. So, for comparison to modern forms, they differ from the stegostomatidae and ganglimostomidae because they have just a notch here. These extant groups have a long anal fin space and, of course, very specialized uh, uh, caudal fin. They differ from the brachylurideae in also having the modern forms have a long uh, anal fin space. They differ from the hemiskyliidae in that uh, pelvic fins are placed very far forward on the fish. But they're, oh golly, they're very similar to the erectilobates, the modern erectilobates. They have a short uh, uh, caudal anal you know, fin space and uh, they're, uh, they have uh, pelvic fins that are more posteriorly placed. Um, Mylodapus has a solid intermedialia, no large foramina unlike uh, this skeleton at the Canadian Museum of Nature. This particular specimen here is the specimen we collected at Idisley. It came with uh, anterior centra as well. These are tail centra. As you can see, a lot of the intermediality is open, so it's very constricted uh, medially. But uh, we hadn't seen a tail of myelodapus before, but we know it's myelodapus occurred with teeth, denticles, and anterior centra. So a uh, very important specimen. Becky prepared this, uh, dusted it, photographed it, cropped it out for this talk. So uh, thank you. They look identical to erectilobates, which have that large lateral foramen, uh, radial lamella. So these are uh, erectilobiform uh, centra. So we're classifying it in the order erectilobiforms. Centra have a few radial lamellae. Centra are large. With, have a large lateral foramina and open intermediality. There are no thorns or spines present, and the clasper canal is present. So that's an erectilobiform. We're classifying this as a family erectilobidae. They have a dorsal caudal lobe that's long, a ventral lobe that's absent. They have a posterior anal fin base abutting uh, the anterior of the uh, caudal fin. The anal and caudal fin separated by a pronounced notch. The uh, anal fin is moderately tall, overall short for uh, many sharks, and uh, the caudal uh, vertebral column is elevated. So uh, Capetta highlighted the need uh, to use a skeletal material. Uh, we agree with that. Now, I'm not ready to say this is Restesia americana. It didn't occur with teeth. But there's a good argument for saying that these uh, are either closely related or probably the same taxon. Now, uh, Restesia, uh, from the teeth, we know occur in the Mastrichian deposits of Alberta, Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado. This lineage uh, also occurs in Alberta in the Campanian, uh, but also Wyoming, New Mexico, and Texas. So they've been around for a while. So extant erectilobids are all marine, and uh, a few species of the hemiskyliidae are sometimes found in brackish waters. Rarely. They're all marine, though. Um, this was found in a fluvial deposit, river channel deposits. These are fully fresh water. And the Western Interior Seaway was quite a long ways away, about 900 kilometers away, I estimate. Um, so these things are moving up river a long ways. They disappear uh, after the dinosaurs go extinct uh, in the Cenozoic. So they're probably a biology that's tied back to that interior seaway, that marine situation. So, I've identified a new species of Mylodapus in this talk. Uh, the Erectilobit, Restesia americana, from teeth, and i uh, talked about its lineage. And then um, identified the skeletal material as an Erectilobit. So, there. That's who they are. With that, I'm wrapping it up, guys. Thank you very much uh, to the Cooperating Society for funding me so generously over the years, and even bringing me here now. 
Um, I'd like to uh, thank Jordan for his assistance with uh, Jordan Sternberg notes. That's on behalf of Darren and uh, me as well. Uh, Kieran Shepard, Margaret Curry, Steve Kumba, Canadian Museum of Nature for assistance with the collection there for all three of us, uh, Becky, Darren, and myself when we visited. Uh, Ugo for his assistance in the field, Jane for collecting for collecting and sorting uh, microvertebrate material that's used in this study, Bob Toman uh, for access uh, to uh, the shark on his land, and Jen Fenceski for those beautiful images, satellite images that she produced for this talk. So with that, I'll accept questions.